recording. Okay. Record, record, <laughs> Thank record. You. Okay. I was about so, to say something. All right. Okay. So um, I'm going to ask each speaker um, to, um, before, you know, she begins to speak, just tell a little bit about yourself because I didn't uh, give justice in just introducing you. So tell us a little bit about your, your career in healthcare and any other personal things you'd like to add. So now um, I am going to stop sharing. And um, Ms. Nichols, it's on you now. All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Lilia Nichols. I'm a registered nurse here in Seattle, Washington. I see some familiar faces. It's good to see everybody. Um, so I am a registered nurse. I'm a pediatric nurse by trade. That's my background. Um, but I am a small business owner here in Renton, Washington. I run an um, independent case management organization for um, underserved brown and black children that look like us. Um, I am the newly appointed vice chair for this or for this committee and I'm excited to present what I have come up with today for you guys. So I'm gonna stop my video and give me just a second to pull up my presentation. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yes, I hear you. Yes. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about COVID-19 updates, where we are now, updates on the disease and prevention. So this presentation that I'm gonna be giving you today is gonna to give you an overview on where we are currently, like I said, um, further updates on the disease and continued prevention measures. The novel coronavirus pandemic is undoubtedly the most important public health challenge currently facing mankind since the 1918 pandemic of influenza. As we are feeling the effect of the current pandemic is a known fact of what we just said right now that this, uh, this pandemic is undoubtedly the most important public health challenge. So I present to you today just some information to hopefully guide you, educate you, and better prepare you to prevent, uh, or not prevent, but take better care of yourself. So just to recap, what is COVID-19? COVID-19 is a virus caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2. It is the strain of coronavirus that causes coronavirus disease 2019 and the respiratory illness responsible for this current mm -hmm. pandemic. Older adults and people who have severe underlying conditions like heart, lung disease, or diabetes are at higher risk for this condition or for the virus and for developing serious complications from it. If we look at how the virus is spread, we know that it's a person-to-person -person contact, mainly from person-to-person, -person, typically from respiratory droplets like coughing, sneezing, talking. It is a known fact as well that you can get COVID-19 from touching service surfaces, although it's not the most likely spread or way to spread the virus. Um, it does live on the surfaces for up to 28 days. So just being mindful that touching of the surfaces and being mindful of hand hygiene is still important. Globally, as of November 2nd, 2020, there have been over 9 million people infected with the virus. And of those 9 million people, over 200,000 have lost their lives to the virus. If we look at LOCA data, we are seeing a surge in the number of cases. So we can look at as of November 4th, 2020, and I was actually looking at this some more this morning, Washington has reported, Washington State Department of Health has reported over 112,000 confirmed cases. Of those cases, there's over 2,400 deaths within those numbers. Fun fact, um, just as we think about what we're supposed to be doing and how we contribute to the numbers, there's only 74% of Washingtonians that are currently in compliance, well, we, for lack of better words, um, in the mask wearing. And so if you are part of that 74%, continue to do a good job and be a part of the solution. Again, diving deeper, King County, um, as we are 
living within this county, there's over 29,000 cases. I looked at that this morning and they're actually, it's, we're three away from 30,000 as of 3 p.m. last night, or excuse me, 3 p.m. yesterday. Um, our hospitals are overwhelmed as we, um, we know that that's where the infection, um, the treatment and, and care for those individuals will be um, with only over 2,600 hospitalizations. And currently in King County, there's over 800 deaths. And that was as of the, sick, um, excuse me, as of two days ago, but when I looked yesterday, we are more towards um, 900. If we dive deeper into the King County data, it shows the number of confirmed cases by sex and by um, age. And so it looks like the females ages 20 to 39 have the highest reported confirmed cases. And while we know that the, the virus is in fact affecting and impacting the black community at an alarming rate, and we'll dive a little bit deeper into that um, shortly, Washington State currently shows that the non-Hispanic white residents have the most confirmed cases in Washington State with the black community um, coming in with 4,375 confirmed cases. The Hispanic community with the large number tailing behind the white community. And again, this is just reported confirmed cases. So where are we now? And why are we seeing this resurgence in cases? So currently we are in what we are calling the resurgence or the second wave. Um, of the COVID impact and many experts have warned and they previously warned of the second wave and that it was coming and the need to be prepared. Some of the things that we're trying to look back at, did we open up too fast? Why are the cases climbing the way they are? Um, it is known right now and it is actually data has proven that the cases are not climbing because of localized outbreaks, but more so because of the disease transmission being widespread. That's due to small family parties, uh, the colder flu, um, flu season that we're currently amongst, testing availability, which now um, there's more contract uh, tracing, and the testing has gone from, you know, just a few sites to several sites within um, the communities. Um, there's also close contact in colleges and universities. We've seen where the, the large outbreaks have occurred on the campuses. And there's also um, currently no state across the United States that's seen a decline in the uh, COVID-19 cases. So what we're seeing is it's not just Washington that the uprise in the um, infection rate is across the nation. Um, there's some reasons to blame. Like I said, the small family gatherings, um, the current flu season, um, these reasons are what we're seeing and why we're seeing the uptake, but the combination of all of these is where is where what has led us to where we are today. COVID-19 on the impact on the black community as we've seen all across the news and then just personal impact. Um, my father had COVID, caught COVID early on in March, or no, excuse me, in July and perfectly healthy, um, black man who caught the virus and had a secondary complication of having a stroke and ended up in the hospital twice. He's better now with some memory impact, but the longstanding um, impact, we'll go into that a little bit as well. So it, COVID-19 has shined a light on pre-existing conditions within the healthcare system as it relates to the black community. Um, Long-standing systemic health and social inequalities have put many people from racial and ethnic minority groups at an increased risk of getting COVID, from access to health care to education, um, health insurance. Uh, the latest mortality rate is 2.4 2 times higher than our white communities. And again, we've seen in county, er, in county numbers, based on the numbers reported, it shows that our white uh, the white community has a higher number, but as we look deeper into the black community, we know that we are impacted at a severely higher rate. And as the, as the pandemic unfolds and more initiatives and um, organizations are looking to dismantle and break down some of these barriers, we know that the more data is coming available regarding infections, mortality rates, and testing, and we'll continue to shed lights on the way the crisis is affecting the different social demographic groups, but more importantly, as it relates to us, we pay attention to the education that comes out and apply it as needed. So we go into um, how do we prevent and protect ourselves? What can we do? 
uh, to continue to stay healthy. Again, just continuing with the current measures that are already in place, social distancing, hand washing, hand sanitizer. You go into the grocery stores these days and you have to ask for the hand sanitizer, whereas prior to, um, well, back in March and April and early on in the pandemic, it was readily available. So just being mindful that you are protecting yourself. Hand sanitizer is still recommended. Hand hygiene is still um, one of the prevention measures. Social distancing, um, hygiene etiquette, covering your mouth, your nose, just basic etiquette um, and hygiene. Seeking medical attention um, when you don't feel sick. Um, a lot of people are, or a lot of things that are going on right now that we see in the healthcare field is people aren't showing up for just uh, regular things that are, that are, that we would become ill with prior to COVID. So just making sure that if you feel sick, no matter what it is, that you um, reach out and seek medical attention and follow the directions of the national and local authority. So if if we're in phase two or we're in phase one, depending on what county you're in, making sure that you are being mindful and following the guidelines. Protection measures continue to stay home if you don't feel well. Um, if you feel mild symptoms such as headaches, slight fever, not everything is COVID, but just being mindful that these are the symptoms that have been associated or potentially um, could be the symptoms of COVID. If you need to go out to get food and supplies, be mindful wearing a mask, social distancing. Um, and again, you're wearing the mask to protect others from you. And then if you do have to travel, making sure that you reach out to your primary care provider um, or that you are getting tested when needed. Most people do recover from the disease without needing any type of treatment. Um, there's no cure for the virus currently, and there's no um, vaccine for the virus, which we'll go into just a little bit, and you'll have another presentation on that later. But together, we will get through this if each person does their part within this um, during this time to prevent the spread. Again, like I told you, uh, my father, this hit home very close. Um, he's got memory issues. He's, um, he even himself has thought about joining a support group for people that have had COVID just because um, he, has, he says he just doesn't feel like himself. And so what we know is that there are long-term effects from the virus. And while the virus has so far seemed to kill mainly, or seemed to affect, excuse me, mainly people in their 60s or older, its long-term effects on people of all ages um, can be potentially debilitating. So the symptoms can persist for months. Um, some people have, even that have caught the virus early on, still have lingering symptoms. Uh, the virus, as we know, it attacks the lungs, heart, and the brain, but it can damage those areas as well. Um, cause an increased risk for long-term health problems. And again, that older population um, and people with chronic medical conditions are the most, are the most, are the group that are experiencing um, lingering symptoms, such as fatigue, cough, shortness of breath, that inability to just really catch that good breath, um, headache. And we're actually hearing more about joint pains um, from long-term effects of the virus. So although globally there's efforts underway to develop an effective vaccine, there's currently no such vaccine. Um, and as of September, 2020, there's no vaccine that's expected to be released. So I, it's recommended by health officials and encouraged for everyone to get their flu vaccine. And what we know is that the flu vaccine protects you against seasonal influenza. That's given, that's what we've always known. It does not protect you against the coronavirus, but, a, but avoiding the flu is especially important right now. So the flu, the flu vaccine coverage is just going to cover you from that illness, again, not from the coronavirus. And according to the CDC, they recommend that, you, that everyone ages six months and older get their flu vaccine, and it was recommended to get it by the end of October. So if you haven't gotten your flu vaccine, it is important this year. Some resources available um, that you can utilize at your leisure, and it's very important during this time, general information, um, staying educated for yourself and your families on what's going on with the virus, where we are currently with the virus, or if you just need some general information. Mental health and stress is on a, a huge incline right now. It's affecting the Black community. It's affecting everyone across the nation, but it's specifically um, suicide rates are higher amongst our young Black male. Um, our youth and adults are, are struggling. So mental health resources available within the community. And then a full list of COVID contacting, uh, or excuse me, testing sites. You can call 
um, to get the, the hours of operation. They're no cost to you. You can walk up and drive through. Um, interpretation of services are available at some of the locations, but the testing is again free for you. And as this was a quick update, if you have any questions, please um, feel free to visit our website. You can email the Seattle King County um, NAACP Health Committee as well. Um, but there will be further updates on vaccines and more information following my presentation. Well, thank you so much, Lilia, for that wonderful presentation. Um, just really gave me a lot of information too. Now we're going to have a about 10 to 15 minutes at the end. So if you have your questions, hold those until the end of the presentations and we uh, will uh, entertain questions. So thank you so much. And now our next speaker is Dr. Blissa Tanaka, who is our pharmacist, who's going to talk to us about the latest medication and treatment methods or modalities. Good morning. Let me Good get morning. my screen up. If I can share my video for a second. Um, let's see if my slides are going though. Okay, good morning. My name is Lisa Tanaka. Oh, and can Tanaka. everyone see my slides? I'm so sorry, I mispronounced your name. I should have called you first. Tanaka. Okay, <laughs> nope. sorry. No worries. Okay. No worries. Um, just a little background on myself. I am originally from Honolulu, Hawaii, um, and I went to Omaha, Nebraska to get my pharmacy degree at Creighton University. And then after that, I proceeded to the Veterans Affairs Hospital here in Seattle, Washington, and did an additional year of training or a residency um, to do some more clinical work. Right now, I work in the community, uh, mostly with geriatric patients. Um, and that's just a little about my background. So let's get started today talking about some current treatments for COVID-19. So right now, there are a couple treatments that are being used and most of them are being used um, as emergency authorization use is what they call it um, and it's something that they are investigating or looking for evidence of safety and efficacy in COVID-19 and they're not sure if it works well or not. Um, so the current treatments are remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, dexamethasone, convalescent plasma, and our latest um, medication treatment is called Regeneron. So remdesivir is actually an antiviral medication and it is currently the only medication approved by the FDA for treatment of COVID-19. It is used in adults and children at least 12 years or older that are weighing more than 88 pounds that are hospitalized and I'm going to focus on that. So this treatment is only used for patients that are in the hospital that are very, very sick. Um, it works by limiting the spread of COVID-19 within the body and shortening recovery time for patients. Uh, remdesivir is also given by injection and use is currently limited to severely ill patients that are hospitalized. Um, some conflicting evidence came out from the World Health Organization recently as well. Uh, they do not think that remdesivir is effective um, in preventing or fighting COVID-19 at this time but they also have limited evidence. Um, the FDA had bigger studies that they felt were more uh, robust and showed more good evidence for remdesivir in COVID-19. Um, so they came out with that authorization to approve remdesivir use um, October 22nd of 2020. So pretty recent that that evidence came out. The next medication is hydroxychloroquine. It's an anti-malarial medication um, commonly used for autoimmune condi conditions such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, a recent University of Washington study showed that hydroxychloroquine does not prevent people from getting COVID-19 and does not help them get, uh, heal any faster from COVID-19. The FDA no longer recommends its use. Um, after several studies showed no benefit and potentially serious side effects from hydroxychloroquine. And the FDA actually revoked that emergency use authorization for hydroxychloroquine in June of 2020. So um, our next treatment is dexamethasone. It is a corticosteroid. 
commonly used for many different diseases such as autoimmune conditions, asthma, allergies, and skin conditions. It is thought that dexamethasone helps the body decrease the inflammatory response of the body to limit lung and organ damage. Dexamethasone is only used in hospitalized patients who are mechanically ventilated or requiring supplemental oxygen. Um, this is one of the treatments that President Trump got. Um, some of the side effects that come along with corticosteroid treatment include insomnia, emotional lability, um, increase in your blood sugars, um, and with long-term use, there's actually more severe side effects. Um, and again, this is only used in severe or critical COVID-19 patients. Um, so this is not something we would see on an outpatient basis. You would have to be in the hospital getting treatment to receive this. The next treatment is convalescent plasma. Um, this is kind of a novel new treatment that they're really not sure if it works, but again, we don't have many treatments available to us. So they're just continuing to try to use it and seeing um, if they're seeing any benefit from it. Um, what happens is they use blood from patients who have recovered from COVID-19. The blood is processed and leaves behind only the plasma and antibodies. The hope is that by giving sick patients the plasma and antibodies from a patient who has recovered will help boost the immune system to better fight COVID-19 in those sick patients. This treatment is very limited to hospitalized patients who are very sick again. Currently, there's not enough data to say if this treatment is useful or not. Um, again, this is a novel treatment that you know, we don't usually see used on, on just any other typical virus. So there's not much um, that we can say as far as is it working or is it not working. Um, there are ongoing studies in hospitals right now using convalescent plasma. And then our last treatment, um, again, this is something that President Trump got. It's called Regeneron. It is a monoclonal antibody drug cocktail. So it combined two monoclonal antibodies, which are man-made proteins that help boost your immune system to fight off infection. This, again, is the medication that President Trump received while hospitalized. It has only been given to a few hundred patients in the entire nation, and it is only under compassionate use, which is when a not yet approved drugs are given to patients outside of clinical trials if your disease is serious or life-threatening. I will repeat this one more time. Regeneron is not widely available to the public at this time, and we don't know enough at this point to say if Regeneron is useful in COVID-19. So evidence is continually changing. The evidence for COVID-19 becomes new every day. There's articles that come out on a daily basis in the medical forums. This is just a snapshot of the current treatments today and evidence at this point in time. As always, please seek medical attention if you have a fever or symptoms of COVID-19. And most importantly, continue to wear your mask, wash your hands, and stay socially distanced. We all need to do our part to prevent COVID-19 exposure and infection. Thank you, Dr. Blissa. That was wonderful. And I will have some questions at the end. Okay, uh, we're moving forward and make sure you hold on to those questions because we're going to have a period where you can ask questions. Our next presentation will be on vaccines, updates, and trials uh, by Erica Piki. Uh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Unmute yourself, Erica. Is it working now? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. okay, you were muted. I'll, yeah. I'll go on video really quick just so you guys can put a name to the face. Hi, I'm Erica. And I'm going to stop my video and just um, show my presentation part. But let me know at any point if you can't hear me or anything like that. I can uh, speak louder or anything like that. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Erica Pegues. I'm honored to be presenting at today's COVID-19 update. 
Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the general development of the vaccine and the important role our community plays in developing, develop, that development. I work right now as a program assistant with the vaccine trials unit at Fred Hutch. So we'll just keep going. All right, well, like I said, my name is Erica, and now that we've really knocked out the professional title, I'll kind of get down to the real deal. Um, any, my, I'm an NAACP member. I'm a student at Bellevue College. Um, I'm in the health and wellness program, and I'm a big help advocate for health, um, community health and you know, letting people know what's going on and having them completely involved and transparent in healthcare. Um, I'm not sure if everyone knows her, but I did ask so back in 2000. Uh, 2014. I've been in science since 2012. So that's, I'm working on my eighth year, my eighth year or so now at Fred Hutch. Um, I don't know if everyone knows Miss Payne, but Miss Payne snagged me up in 2014 and really didn't let me go. After that, um, I have two brothers. My mom's actually on this call right now, and so is one of my brothers. They were both very, very athletically gifted, but I was beyond uncoordinated. So I took the science route rather than um, any sort of sports in high school or things like that. So I got to go to AXO. Um, here are some photos of that. And so you've been able to see over the years, I have steadily been involved in science. It's always been a reoccurring pattern for me. Um, community health is a huge passion of mine. Um, hence why I'm now working at, or in school for health and wellness at Bellevue College. And you can kind of think of that as public health right now. Um, I joined the health committee and took on the responsibility of doing the COVID weekly update. So if you visit the Seattle King County NAACP website and you go to the health tab, that the coronavirus watch section is where I'm keeping updates of the you know cases that are coming up, kind of like what Lil Lilia was saying. Um, she she kind of got this information from the same spots that I get the information, um, and we kind of put the numbers out of what's going on, you know, case wise. And like she had also mentioned, we are at a peak, so these numbers are daunting when you're seeing them weekly. So you should um, definitely check that out. I mean, that's my job, so check it out even if you're just supporting me. <laughs> it makes me excited. Um, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, one of the biggest hurdles that I run into in my job is people not fully understanding what the clinical research process is. So in my job, I work on two different clinical research trials for COVID-19. Um, my job, we actually work on trials also for HIV um, and the couple other viruses like retrovirus and things like that. Um, but for, you know, this portion, I really think it's important for in COVID-19 being such a big deal right now that I tell people what it is that the clinical research process is. Um, clinical research happens in three different phases. And I think oftentimes people don't realize that there's multiple steps that get us there. And when they do realize that there are, it alleviates some of the fear of what's going on. So clinical research, like I said, happens in three phases. The first phase is really on a small group of people and we're really just looking as if what we're doing is safe. So in the case of the vaccine, we're, we were only testing on a small number of healthy volunteers to see if the virus was safe. Um, once we were able to you know, knock that part out, we went into phase two. And in phase two, we start going to hundreds of volunteers to identify dosage and the administration schedule for the vaccine. Um, and we're really just looking as if it is actually working. And then phase three, which is where we're at now, we're just seeing kind of in bigger groups of people, you know, several thousand volunteers, we're testing the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. So we're testing, is it actually doing what we want it to do? Another hurdle that we run into often is people not understanding that vaccine development doesn't just, you know, it, it usually takes longer. And what it is, the anti-vax movement is so popular right now, and it's been for the couple of years, past couple of years, but um, I like to just kind of breeze over and say, like, what it is vaccines actually are doing. So vaccines are given, administered to people, and they're giving your body advanced information about the virus so that if for some reason your body is getting invaded, you, your body will know how to respond. So 
the vaccines given to your body, your body is able to recognize and alert the immune system when it needs to kick into high gear and start working. And then your body, the goal of the vaccine is that your body will have the tools to prevent and control infection and reduce the severity of an illness if you do get it. So it would be wrong of me not to stress the importance of the flu shot this year. Um, the flu shot is significantly more important this year because in conjunction with COVID, a flu outbreak could overwhelm and strain hospitals. And that being said, I really, you know, am encouraging everybody to get that flu shot. Um, it helps, and it's, you know, differentiate, you know, everyone thinks everything is COVID right now, but protecting yourself from the flu is a good way to kind of you know, get some sort of comfort in knowing that you likely don't have, you know, COVID. You could also have just, you know, you're preventing yourself from getting the flu when you can't get COVID. So one of the two studies that I work on is the COVID, the COVID cohort study. And in this study, it's just an observational study. And we're seeking participants that have only, that have tested positive for COVID-19. Um, an observational study is just observing certain variables that we to determine correlation. We're not actually like an experimental study where we're controlling variables to determine causality. Um, so the COVID cohort study, we're not actually giving anybody anything. We just see people on a weekly basis and we are just, you know, gathering information because we, you know, this pandemic is so new and it's so fresh. We don't know what is going to happen long term in your body. A lot of people that have gotten COVID have said, you know, they experience brain fog post COVID or they experience not having their taste be the same or their sense of smell be the same. So our um, study is really looking at the response post COVID, you know, what your immune system is doing during COVID and then after COVID, what the long term effects could be. The other study that we are doing is a vaccine study and you know, there's lots of studies happening in Seattle now. One of the more popular ones is Moderna. We aren't doing Moderna, um, but we are seeking participants that have never tested positive for COVID-19. We are looking for folks, you know, in our priority populations that can include people with underlying health conditions and um, people with greater chances of exposure. So essential workers um, and, and we're starting to see people going back to work. So it's really starting to be broader for everybody really. Um, we're also looking for people who live and work in elderly care facilities. Um, we're looking for folks that are over the age of 65 and um, people that work in jails or pr prisons. And most importantly, we're looking for people that are of racial and ethnic groups that have been hit hardest by the pandemic. Um, this can include the Black African American community, Latinx, um, American Indian or Alaska Natives. Um, I also want to point out that vaccines are made using synthetic copies and pieces of viruses. There's not actually any virus in vaccines and that goes for most all vaccines. Um, I got this um, chart from the CDC and I think it's important to note how big of a disparity you can see from the first three um, portions where it says like Hispanic and Latino, non-Hispanic Black, and non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Natives, it's almost tripled or it's over tripled the amount of um, some of the other races. And I think that that's really something that's close to heart for me. I am a huge advocate for our universal health care. I think it's great. I really wish that it was more common. Um, and it's it's important to me that I involve these groups of people because I don't want a health disparity like this that's this significant. Um, I don't think it's fair, it's not just, and I think you know, in this day and age, we should be doing better than that. So my, um, my part of that is I really aim to educate people um, because I think that's where a lot of fear stems from. It uh, stems from a lack of education of what, you know, what it is that happens in a clinical trial and what it is that's in a vaccine, things like that is really important to me that we educate people and let them have a complete understanding. And if, you know, for, for those of the anti-vaxxers, you know, giving them information, not discrediting them for what they think, but maybe presenting new information for them so they can make their own judgment and own decisions when it comes to their health. So again, being transparent with people, letting people dictate their own health outcomes, I think is very important. That's something that we've um, my group at Fred Hutch really works to, works at, um, we meet about it every day, sorry. <laughs> so it's important that, like I said, that our community is 
very involved in their own health decisions and their health outcomes. What we find that stands in our way is, like I said, lack of um, education. Um, people are bombarded with myths, with myths and misinformation. Uh, fake news travels five times faster than real news does. And that's absolutely insane. So I really try to make myself available for people to give them information when they ask. Um, we also find that people who, you know, are feeling stigmatized by the anti-vax movement, you know, your neighbor could say something and convince you, you know, just one conversation, they don't realize what they're saying could just, you know, make you feel like you shouldn't do something. Um, we also have a higher than normal number of citizens that are doubting our vaccine development because of COVID-19, like because it's so fresh and it's so um, politically involved right now. And the last thing that's really been an issue for us is that people who want to help that don't know how to help um, and be a part of things like this. So um, I will give a website that we use to kind of help people get involved. And um, that way, if you guys have any questions, you feel free to reach out to me. Um, but for our, my presentation particularly, some key points that I want to leave you with is that you cannot get COVID-19 from, from the vaccine. Um, I also want to leave you with that there are three phases of clinical trials that are active right now. Um, and then also that all clinical trials have the option to opt out at any point of the trial. Um, I, historically, that has not been true, but it is true now. Um, I also want to point out that the flu vaccine is essential during this pandemic and that there are ways to get involved that don't include enrolling in a clinical trial. So here I have, oh, I don't know if this has been covering it. Sorry, guys. Um, here I have our website, um, www.preventcovid.org. This is where people are directed to, oops, to sign up if they want to join our, our screening registry, if they want to be a part of it. We also have a lot of community advisory boards, um, things that people can just advise on. They don't actually have to be a part of our trial. And if they're ineligible, they can also still be involved. So I've, I've listed my email address here. So if anyone has any questions, you can absolutely feel free to send me an email. Um, and, I think that's all I've got. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. So now for our questions. Uh, Erica, you stay on and let's begin with questions for Erica. Uh, are there any questions for Erica right now? Uh, yeah, I had a question. And it's actually for all three presentations. If the PowerPoints mm -hmm. are available, can they be sent to us? Because I work for a mental health organization and we could really benefit from any information that's COVID related. So I'm just wondering. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll ask the speakers. Yes, that's not a problem. Kevin, we can get you those. Okay, okay great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Wonderful. That would be fine with me. I, I would just add date onto what? my slides. Pardon me? Uh, let's just add a date. So that, yeah, uh, add a date and do it in a PDF format too. Everybody do your slides in a PDF format. Make sure your name is on there, you know, and a date. That's good. That's what I always forget to do. When I send my slides, I forget to put who, who slides there. I forget to put my name on things. So make sure you put your name on there. Make sure you uh, put a date on there and uh, make it a PDF. Because if your name is under, you don't want any of uh, your information compromised if we begin to send these uh, slides out. Right. Thanks. Okay, and I'm also happy you. to do that as well for you, Mr. Henry. And if you are interested, I'm happy to present to your group as well. We have some okay. of our uh, questions. I'm going to put my email in the chat too. Great. I'll send you an email. Good. Great. Thank you. Now, um, I have a um, question for uh, Erica. So Erica, you said there is no vaccine available now. No, everything is a phase three clinical trial right now. Okay. All right. And then for the group, is there any date as to when you think that vaccine might become available? Erica. I... I don't see a date where it's going to be publicly available, you know, for everyone yet. Uh, mm -hmm. We do have it. every the trials are open right now and actively enrolling, so you are able to sign up and participate in trials, but it hasn't been fully approved and it's not completely done yet. And so you are recruiting 
people yes. of color. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you all listen to that, and we need to be representing this because when they do research, we find out some medications are not as effective in people of color, especially, you know, we did the hypertension presentation recently. There are certain medications that perform better in African Americans than other groups. So it's important that we're represented in these trials. So also you want to tell your family members too. And Erica will um, send her, uh, I'll make sure everyone gets her information so you can contact her if you're interested in being part of the trials. And then one other question for Erica. Now, Erica, um, this vaccine that's in trial, is that uh, one injection or two injections? Because we've been hearing uh, in the media that there's some that are one injections, there are some that are two injections. So what is the trial you're doing? So the trial I work on is two injections, one on your first visit and one a couple of weeks later. Okay, so it's weeks later, not months later, like some of our immunizations. No, not, not months later. Okay, all right. Anybody else have any more questions for Miss Erica? Okay, thank you so much, Erica. Wonderful presentation and lots of good information. Okay. Anyone have any questions for uh, Miss Lilia, our first speaker? And I'll ask you, I see there's some questions in the chat. So go on and um, read your questions for me, if you have questions for uh, Lilia. Okay. All right. And then what about questions? Um, for our pharmacists, I see there's some questions going and um, read your question out, Dinah. You had a question. Ask your question. You're on mute. Yeah. Okay, I'll ask the question Dinah has here. What are some of the side effects of Regeneron? Right. I, um, I know it's only available compassionate use, but what are some of the long-term um, side effects. The, they're, hi, Diana. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, they actually aren't known yet. Uh, there has been so little use of Regeneron in general that we don't know. Um, it is still up in the air. And because only a few hundred patients have received the drug, we don't have enough data to give you side effect information that will be um, extrapolated out to the ma major population. So we need more information before I can give you good answers to that question. Well, out of those 100, how many are alive? You know, I am not sure, honestly. Okay. I, I, I don't think they have published a lot of their data yet because they have not had many patients use it. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, this is Linda. Um, I had a question for Erica. When she talked about the three phases of the trials, and I think you mentioned safety in the first phase, but you mentioned safety in the third phase. How does the safety in the first phase different, differ from the safety requirements in the third phase? Good question. So the first phase of safety is more so if, if, you know, sorry, I'm trying to think how I could best explain this. Mm. Um, we're thinking more safety in a small group of people versus of safety in a bigger group of people. Um, like Dr. Anderson was saying, you know, it, medications affect different groups of people differently and can affect everybody differently. Um, in phase three, since we're taking such a much bigger sample size, you, we're testing it over bigger population groups. So, you know, seeing like, you know, is this effective in, you know, the um, black community? Is this effective in Hispanic community? Is this effective in, you know, everybody versus just having such a smaller group of people where in the phase one, we're just testing, you know, is it safe in general to give to people? Um, so that's kind of the, the difference there. But throughout all phases, we're testing, you know, safety. Um, I, I know it's, it's public information that, our, that all, of the, all of the trials were paused. Um, and, I, and that was a way for us to kind of, though it's alarming for sure for a lot of people, it's also a way to show 
that these rules and regulations that are put in place to show safety in our trials is being utilized and being forced. Um, so we are testing safety in all three phases. And I really should have emphasized that. I apologize um, throughout all of the testing trial, um, testing phases, sorry. Yeah. So it's not a type of, like I thought first might be life-threatening kind of consequences. You want to eliminate those first or, so you're saying the same set of variables is kind of throughout, it's just a number of people? Yes, yeah. So we, okay. in phase one, it's, it's more so that's, you know, really, the, phase one is really where we're testing, is this okay to even give to people? Um, is this safe and effective to give to people in the first phase? And then third phase is more so, is it effective to give to bigger groups of people? So like you said, it's just really... Um, Volume, yeah. almost. In, in a phase, um, I see you commented, uh, Ms. Benton, um, it, we're testing dosage in phase two. So that's kind of like when we're really looking at that portion. For phase one is only focused on safety and um, how the body is um, responding to it. And is there a realistic time frame to see these things emerge? Um, or is it so unknown that, I don't know, it just. So uh, one of my other questions that I get asked a lot is why did it happen so fast? Is that mm -hmm. kind of what you're asking me? Like, why yeah, you hear that a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's no, that's a very good question. You know, when I first, you know, signed on to my job, that was my question <laughs> was how did it happen so quickly? Um, no phases got skipped. Nothing um, was, you know, we didn't zoom through anything quick. Um, we just kind of overlapped the phases for a lot of these things. So. Um, if they're intentional about using healthy volunteers so that they can see in pretty immediately similar to like the flu shot when you get the flu shot you feel um you so people think that they get sick from the flu shot that's really not actually what's happening your body's responding to having something given to it and something new so that's kind of what we were doing as well so we didn't we were checking to see it happened in months of time versus you know years of time but we since we overlapped the phases we were able to start as soon as we had um, safety data collected and analyzed from the earlier phases so the next the newer phases while in long-term follow-up like we'll be in newer phases while we're doing long-term follow-up so everything's happening kind of simultaneously does that make any does that make sense sorry it's hard to explain <laughs> but i hope that was okay yeah, and yeah. I, I understand the questions because things did seem to be rushed along, you know, just from the media, the political climate and everything. And lots of the community is wondering, you know, those type of things, um, Brenda, you know, that's a common uh, concern of the community. Is it being pushed through? Did we skip steps? And Erica, you confirmed there was no skipping of steps. I guess there was a real focus towards getting us a vaccine. But, yeah. you know, yeah, go ahead. So we, we didn't, I, if, for COVID-19, it happened when it happened a lot of, and I can say this from Fred Hutch's point of view, a lot of other trials got paused because every, all of the money and, okay. you know, investments were getting put into COVID research. So usually the, the hurdles that would stop people, you know, stop the phases and make them take longer were eliminated because there was such an urgency to get this vaccine working and going you know going and you know making it public eventually so that yeah, money makes a big difference okay. sorry mm -hmm. i just said money makes a big difference so in the first one so we kind of know that the components of the vaccine are safe yes okay okay mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. yeah yeah and you know, and i understand the concern of the community i've had people call me and say, now, are you going to take that vaccine if it's offered? Mm -hmm. You know, so people are concerned about it. And those are some valid questions uh, that you asked. Um, yeah, yeah. Do we have any other questions? I have a question for um, Lilia, the integrity nurse. Uh, Lilia, uh, has the governor made any changes because of the surge that is happening? At one point, we seem to be doing pretty good here in the state of Washington. We're getting the virus under control, but 
we're like the rest of the country is um, surging here in Washington too, in spite of all the things that we had implemented. So has the governor made any changes as far as any phases that we are in? Is he backtracking on any phases at all? Um, that's a good, really good question, Dr. Phyllis. And so as of now in King County, we have not gone back um, with phases. We are phase two for the most part. There have been talks um, because other surrounding um, counties and, I mean, excuse me, surrounding states like Oregon has just taken back some of their uh, rollouts from transitioning to the different phases and opening back up. So I, it's it's looking like we will be going back somewhere, um, whether it's gatherings of 50 or less in the um, restaurants and things like that, but we haven't heard anything from the governor as of yet. Okay. All right. Now, um, if there are no other questions, any other questions, I'd like to give each speaker one last word basically to underscore in your presentation. So uh, Lilia, integrity nurse, we'll start with you. I would underscore to do your part and to make sure that you take care of yourself first, to put your own oxygen mask on first, and then do your part to help the community wearing masks, social distancing, and um, hand hygiene, and just really taking care of that, that health etiquette. And okay. thank you for listening today. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Tanaka, our pharmacist, your last word, what you'd like to underscore? I would like to just underscore that you know, there is not enough information at this point for treatments of COVID-19. So your best bet would be to prevent yourself from getting COVID-19 as much as possible and protect the rest of the health of, you know, the people around you as best as possible. Okay, thank you. That was important. Okay, Ms. Piki, your last word and what you want to underscore? I would tell people to be willing to learn and educate yourself when it comes to this and to be willing to, to you know, tell your, your colleagues and your friends and your family and help everyone get to a better understanding of what actually happens in clinical trials. Okay. I'd like to, on behalf of, uh, as chair and on behalf of the health committee and our local NAACP, Seattle King County, I'd like to thank you all for attending and I'd like to thank our wonderful speakers for your presentations. Excellent job in doing that. And I want to keep those, want those on the line to be aware and always find out what we're doing. Our next big event, I think our next big event that we're going to be have it's going to be a big event we're planning for uh, February, um, Black History Month. We want to talk about bias, racial bias in healthcare. So um, stay tuned for that. We're working on that. Thank you all for your attendance, and have a wonderful day. <laughs>